Good day, ladies and gentlemen, and we are back for more Star Wars reviewing, and I am, of course, joined by... Rannick. And H. And I'm sharing the pain, because today we are here to take a look at Attack of the Clones, released way back in 2002. I personally still remember going to the theater to see that particular film. Uh, it was at a theater chain called Tinseltown. I remember walking up to the thing... And seeing on the little marquee, Star Wars 2. And I was like, that's not Star Wars 2. You know, Star Wars 2 is, you know, Empire Strikes Back. It's like, how dare you besparge the good name. Oh, I'll tell you this. I was not looking forward to Attack of the Clones. It wasn't something I was dreading or anything. I just didn't care. I saw some of the hype. I bought some of the toys. Because the toys were... Honestly, the toys were better than the movie. But I bought some of the toys. Some of the Django Fett figures. You know, one clone... I saw that there's a lot of different things run to try to build up hype for uh, Attack of the Clones. Most notably, uh, the Sci-Fi Channel ran a marathon of fan films. That's what the first. That's the first time I ever saw Troopers. Uh, there's even a little skit they did uh, where they had like George Lucas meet Jar Jar and they explained why <laughs> Jar Jar was so bad. And I remember there was like Were some... you in junior high when this came out? Yeah, I was 13 at the time. So I just toys. lost my job with Namco, and I started working, oddly enough, for Best Buy. That seems like a fate worse than uh, watching the film. Not really. Junior high was like the age where you get rid of all your old toys and stuff. Yeah, but see, when, in junior high, I uh, didn't care what other kids did, so I was able to still get you know toys and enjoy them. Hey, like I say, when I first started working for Best Buy, this is right when the Master Replica lightsaber is coming out. So I picked up the Darth Vader and the Mace Windu lightsaber. Sweet. So when did you all first see uh, Attack of the Coins? Like, what, did you see some of the hype? Did you even care? Eh. I went in you know, knowing that the first movie was you know, of the prequels was really rough, but I had a little bit more hope for the sequel because... Basically, I was going off the dope of, hey, well, you know, Empire Strikes Back was better. Oh, I was kind of going through the whole Star Wars bleh phase. <laughs> uh, it's like, because I think all I'd seen was editions on VHS, and I didn't quite get episode, the hype of episode one. And I like I said, this. the trailer for the movie. I sadly know heart for heart, uh, beat for beat by heart because during Best Buy at that time, that's all that was playing on the big screens. <laughs> oh my god, that must have been horrible. And that's when big screens were thick. <laughs> well, not entirely. Remember, plasma screens were coming into play. We mostly used it as a demo to push THX and surround sound. Okay, so what is. Episode 2, Attack of the Clones. Well, <laughs> I was going to finish with my story. Oh, we'll finish up. So, um... Because, <laughs> yeah, at the time, uh, I had that group of friends that were just... They were, like, totally obsessed with the prequels and stuff, and I just didn't get it, and anytime I'd criticize it, you know... It's like, shut up! You're, you just don't get it, man! So... Oh, you get that a lot. Yeah, so I didn't really... Uh, episode 2... I don't know, I didn't care for it. I didn't see it in the theater... I just remember being in high school in drama class, and there was a friend that uh, I talked to, and he said that it was all right. He just, you know, he was like, "Well, the acting still wouldn't, and you know, physics and this." And he said it was okay, and so I was like, "Meh." So I didn't see it until uh, I borrowed the DVD from somebody, like, like years later, and I went with zero expectations, and I thought it was all right. I mean. I don't know. It was like I already knew the acting was gonna be cheesy, like the whole sand line and stuff. I hate sand. Uh, you know, yeah. So uh, it didn't really uh, bother me that much. It was just eh. Like there were some good parts. There's some lame parts, you know. But we'll get to that later, right? <laughs> oh yes. Oh yes. So was episode two. Meh. Uh, I don't know. I mean. It there are definitely some cringy and some wooden parts, but compared to what we would have in the future, nowhere yeah. near as bad. And truth be told, from a person who saw it day one in theaters, it was a good popcorn movie. It, 
it's no Empire Strikes Back, but it wasn't bad. Before we get into this, should we just talk about Hayden Christian right now? <laughs> Hayden Christensen, okay, we'll talk about him for a moment. Hayden Christensen is just like Jake Lloyd in that, you know, when he, when George Lucas is not directing him, he's not that bad. Yeah, uh, yeah, he actually has some movies where he's pretty good and, you know, it's, it's just the dialogue and the directing, they do so much. Well, you know... Yeah, somebody should tell Lucas this is not how humans talk. I know you're into the whole aliens thing, but come on now. It's not just that. It's like, he actually can have good acting presence. It's just, he's not allowed to do so. Every time he opens his mouth, he almost sounds as bad as Twilight Guy. Is there any movies you actually remember him from aside from Jumper? Uh, not really. You know what's funny? I actually read the Jumper book, and it's substantially different. But the film could have been worse. I haven't seen the film, so... I'll take your word for it. Okay, so Attack of the Clones opens up kind of boringly. The biggest problem with, you know, all of these prequels is, except for Episode 3, they all open up real slow. That title, Attack of the Clones. Yeah. It's called Clone Wars. Yeah, it's like, you would think it'd be called Droid Wars, but whatever. I mean, but I get you want to reference 50s movies, but you don't have to reference 50s B-movies like Attack of the Killer Tomato or Attack of the 50-Foot Woman. Hey, Attack of the Killer Tomatoes is 70s, thank you very much. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> Historically inaccurate. <laughs> Not just that, it's the fact it's a gloriously awesome, cheesy B-movie. It also became an animated series. We have Attack of the Clone! Go on. <laughs> and the uh, film starts up with, you know, Amidala, who's now a senator, because we cut to several years after uh, Phantom Madness and you've got her landing on Coruscant. It looks okay but still, is this really what we're thinking when it comes to Star Wars? Where's the actual, you know, war part? She lands... Well, her cruiser actually looks like a bomber. Yeah, it does have a... It does look a little like that but it doesn't actually bomb anything. Instead, it gets bombed because it explodes in a more in a terrorist kind of fashion. Which, again, is sort of like a reference to the modern era at that point, because 2002 did take place just immediately... Well, that's a weird way to say that. 2002 took place immediately after 2001, ladies and gentlemen. In case you didn't know. Oh, logical order. But, yeah, you know, after 2001, so I assume that that's sort of a reference to that. You know, there's an explosion, and we lo find out that, uh, you know, Amidala is constantly being attacked and things of that nature. And that's because they didn't kill off fucking Viceroy Newt Gunray... They just let him, like, basically, does, he, basically after the end of Phantom Menace, nothing happens to him. You know, he invades a planet, kills a bunch of people, but yeah, whatever. He's rich. He can he get got away with really it. good lawyers. Yeah, and That's so... The fact that Padme's handmaiden uh, is here. And it's kind of sad. We also get introduced to not Captain Panaka, Captain Typho, and he's got an eye patch. Uh, he doesn't get to do much. He mainly is just a background character. Although, in the uh, original EU, he does have a particularly cool moment. Uh, and yes, he does die in the EU. I'm not going to spoil how he dies, but he does die in the EU. No, let's be honest. This is before, you know... This is over 30 years before BBY, so a lot of these characters die. Which, in and of itself, is sort of a problem with this film, in that we know it's an utterly pointless film, because nothing that happens in it is really going to matter. Uh... Which is kind of sad in and of itself because there's a lot of there's a lot of good in Attack of the Clones, but there's a lot of bad. And ultimately, the entire time I was watching it, I knew that nothing that was happening really made a difference, and we already know what's going to happen at the end. So ultimately, we get introduced to Obi Wan and uh, Hayden Christensen. Now, Hayden Christensen has some decent screen presence, and Ewan McGregor is. Actually, even better here than in uh, Phantom Menace. They actually have... When the writing is actually good, because a wrong clock can be right twice a day, uh, when the writing is actually good, there is a lot of camar camaraderie between the two characters. Hey, wrong clock? I think you mean broken. One or the other. <laughs> <laughs> the clock what? is wrong. The time. <laughs> that's right somewhere. There's 24 times for it to be right and 24 times to be wrong. Don't know where it's right, don't know where it's wrong, but it's right somewhere. Hey, wait, that sounds exactly like Rian Johnson. But anyway, Rian Johnson is something. Uh, he's not right anywhere. Uh, so what ends up happening is uh, Obi-Wan and 
Anakin are assigned to watch out for Amidala, because of course they are. There's some interesting little flirtation between the t- between Amidala and Anakin. It's kind of obvious that they can end up together, but my big problem is this. You know, Anakin is a lot younger than Amidala. Like, massively younger. It just seems kind of... Nine, nine plus years. Yeah. I mean, I get that, you know, there's greater age disparities, but, you know... <laughs> this you know what this means, right? This means... Senator Amidala, no longer queen, is a cougar. <laughs> yeah, I would this also that. wouldn't be the first time that Natalie Portman would well be with somebody that's well. Actually, in the professional, they had that weird thing. Only she was like fourteen, and he was like forties. <laughs> well, thankfully, they never went that route. Otherwise, that would yeah. Oof. No, no, they didn't. But kind of that, funny because in this it's like reversed <laughs> she's going after someone that's way younger yeah and that's my question though it's like why write it that way I don't I, it's, it's, I think it's only like a Romeo and Juliet thing so I think yeah but that never pans out though they end up getting together and he never we, we don't want to spoil it but that didn't pan out for Romeo or Juliet either yeah so ultimately we get our first accent scene we got Django Fett who and this is way more ruthless than in anything else Basically telling a fellow bounty bounty hunter, bounty hunter Zam Wessel, to basically you know kill Amidala and he, no more failures this time. And you know the hands are a canister of poisonous creatures. And I actually have an R two D two that comes with two little things with those two little things. Believe it or not. So what do we got? We got our first chase scene. Uh, Zam. Uh, inserts the little uh, millipedes into Amidala's room. They crawl around immediately. You know, Anakin senses them and cuts them up. It's always yeah. nice to see a city landscape instead of like a, you know, desert landscape. Yeah, it actually of it really works. Uh, yeah, it actually is much more visually uh, impressive than just desert or forest. So the sad thing is, this assassination attempt would have worked if Zam just decided to screw this and use a shape charge. Yeah, that could have worked too, or, you know, but, but you know, she has style, okay? She got style. She isn't just good. She, a bomb is like amateur, man. You gotta use poisonous, you know, fucking alien millipedes. Because if you screw don't... That. Load the droid up with a thermal detonator, lock it onto a location, go have a death stick. Oh, you know, you just don't have artistry, man. She's a professional. But anyway... She's got style, uh, she's got grace. She's a lady. <laughs> Sorry. Dude, that's but, questionable because she is a changeling. <laughs> so, hey, don't spoil that. If no want. one would have known if they hadn't seen the action figure. Whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> Incidentally, the Zam Wessel action figure, you can find those in dollar stores all over the place because no one gave a shit about her. Which is kind of sad. I don't know if they can now, but back then you could. Well, yeah, you can't see them now, but I remember back when I was a kid, I saw those in there all the time. I actually felt kind of bad for that particular figure, but I never bought one. So, Obi-Wan, you know, jumps out the window, because of course he does, and jumps onto the droid, which you would think, you know, Zam would immediately, you know, self-destruct the thing, but whatever. And he's flying around. Trying to save money. Yeah, those things ain't cheap. And, uh, we then see Anakin do something pretty cool. He, uh, gets in this bright yellow speeder, and just starts driving it around trying to trying to find uh, Obi Wan. They eventually meet back up, and in yet another pretty cool scene, uh, Anakin and him are driving around. And eventually, he sees Zam Wessel's speeder, which I actually have a toy of, believe it or not. That was actually kind of cool. It had a little rubber like crash thing. In any event, he sees her speeder and immediately jumps out. He's like, "If you'll excuse me, that was cool. That's Star Wars. That's what we'd want to see." He does that, and ultimately they end up uh, cornering her, and uh, she, of course, is like, she, she gets her arm cut off. That's the one problem with Jedi. It's like, their first instinct is to cut the arm off. Like, could have beat her over the head, maybe? You know, something like that. Well, we live in a world, in this, you know, in this case, where cybernetics are eh, fairly cheap and easy. So, yeah, an arm shot, yeah, it is debilitating. Yeah, that's probably a better solution, but it's not putting somebody out of the game. It's probably also going back the whole, like, you know, uh, if you stole something, you get hand chopped off. Well, not even that. Here's the thing. Uh, 
Rules-wise, for the D20 system and in the expanded lore, the original lore, not the crappy Marvny lore, uh, going back to the original movie, when I say that, you know, when Obi-Wan takes care of Darth Maul, he earns two dark side points, there's a reason. It's because the Jedi and their sword techniques are given a suggested line of cuts that are moral and all, you know, fine, and some that are not. The arm is fine because it's non-lethal. It's not encouraged, but it's non-lethal. It's fine. When he took out Darth Maul, he cut him across the midsection. That's a no-go, because that causes a lot of undue suffering. Well, he that, still live. <laughs> exactly. It's, you either kill the opponent as quickly and humanely as possible, or you take them out using you know, a less lethal, but still very debilitating cut. That's why they go for the arms. Which I suppose works, but still, you know, it's not. It doesn't make uh, for an easy uh, questioning session. So, this is where we see Django again. She he just straight up, straight up shoots uh, Zam, which seems a little too kind of savage for him, just because they in the expanded universe really kind of almost got together a little bit, and like she actually was sort of like a surrogate mother to Boba Fett. But whatever. Moving along, well, we the, he got to protect yourself in this situation. It's a case of, you know, risk being exposed and, you know, losing out on everything. Or just shoot her. Eh. Which is always kind of sad. So this is where the movie kind of slows up a bit and really kind of... There's a... There's, the big problem with Star Wars movies right after A New Hope is they always like to split the plot. Like, a lot. So what ends up happening after this, there's two different plot lines. You have the Anakin and Padme plot line, and you have the Obi-Wan plot line. The anime and Padme... The anime? The Anakin and Padme yes. plot lines are absolutely horrible. Uh, it's, it's essentially, they make... They almost make... <sighs> Twilight looked good in some respects because they're just so poorly written. But the Obi Wan plot line is actually really bloody good. Uh, I don't know about that. Well, I, we do see further into the Obi Wan character. We see that had he not been a Jedi, he would have actually made for a pretty darn good detective. Because he has to figure out, well, where did the dart that killed Zam come from? That's our only real lead. Is it's a Kamino and Saber Dart. And we have another little sort of a reference to 1950s kind of thing. He literally goes to a Space 50s diner and talks to a Space 50s fat guy who knows everything. Yep. Dexter, Dex, Jetster. Jetster. Uh, bleh, can't talk. Actually, he, a likable CG alien. Yeah, he's actually legitimately cool. Uh, he, of course, points out Kamino, and we get another particularly good scene uh, where, you know. Obi-Wan goes to the Jedi Archive trying to find Kamino. He can't find it. Then obi not Obi-Wan, but Yoda comes in. He's like, where can we find Obi-Wan's missing planet? It's like, this is the Star Wars that I remember. And the entire Obi-Wan plotline is great. But every time we cut to Anakin and Padme, it just slows the film to a crawl. None of the dialogue they get is any good. And they're not bad actors. Both of them are pretty good, but it's just so painful. Every line is just... I wouldn't even say cheesy. It's cringy. Cheesy can be good. Cringy is not. At least Yoda looks a lot better in this than he originally did in episode one. Yeah, he looks like a straw pu He looked like a straw puppet. Before being replaced by PG version in the re-release of episode one, but whatever. <laughs> yeah, what you're seeing here is actually, throughout all the film, is... They had switched SGI workstations and software. The software really allowed them to speed up render times and increase polygon counts. It helped a lot. So with Obi Wan, after he figures out where he kind of figures out where you know uh, Kamino actually is, and so he goes to check it out. That's where he finds the clone army, and he learns that a clone army was being bred by a well was paid for by a Jedi named Sifo Dyas. Now, originally, it was just supposed to be Sio Diaz. Like, it's basically Sidious, but cut in half, which was the dumbest thing imaginable. I'm glad they changed that. It's like... Did you that... smack the mic rain? Sorry. <laughs> yeah, he thought it was annoying, too. <laughs> I did, but thankfully they changed it. 
<laughs> Although now it sounds more like Sisyphus, so it's like, I don't know about that. But, yeah, the clones look pretty cool. You can see some really kind of crappy CG, though. Uh, that has not aged well, the whole cloning tanks and everything. Eh, it could look better, but the whole clone trooper concept was something that really was the standout element of the film. It's like, it's stormtroopers, only way cooler because their armor now kind of looks like Boba Fett. And, you know, all the ancillary media for the clone troopers was what really saved the very Clone Wars concept. So, ultimately, while on Kamino, he ends up meeting Jango Fett! And we actually get some pretty cool scenes with that, and a famous line of, uh, I'm just a simple man trying to make my way through the galaxy. And in many respects, yeah, that's kind of what he is. And the other thing about Django is he is a true neutral bad guy. He doesn't really care about the war. He doesn't really care about the Republic. He just, you know, he's in it for the money. I know that in the sun. And that, too. Uh, we are introduced to young Boba Fett. And he doesn't get too many lines or too much expansion. But it is kind of cool to see where he finally came from. And we finally have a definitive origin for Boba Fett. Prior to this, I think there were something like three different origins for Boba Fett. Like one, he was like a former stormtrooper. Another, he was supposed to be, uh, I think, a guy named Jasper Mareel that changed his name. What's funny is Jasper Mareel would basically become Django's father, believe it or not. So, yeah. So ultimately, we get another fight scene, and it's a particularly good one between Django and Obi-Wan. Django gets to fly around and use a little uh, space lasso, and Obi Wan gets to look cool yet again. And then we get a and chase. They almost die by falling off of the side of one of the Kaminoan buildings. It goes architecture, folks. Forget the safety rails. Forget all that. Planet that permanently permanently rains. You need slip sides on everything. Um, kind of a little far away, like you're in a bathroom. Let's see. I gotta edit that out. Sorry about that. There as you go, much saying, better. Alright. As I was saying, on Camino, uh, you know, they almost die because, you know, planet that rains on absolutely every single day, 24-7. Let's go ahead and have no safety rails and slick sides on everything. Once again, they got style, man. They got style. It's like, you know, why would you not? Okay, so, the... Battle that takes place after this is yet another Obi Wan versus Django battle. Now we got some new ships for this. We've got uh, Slave One, which it, which we'd last seen, I believe, in Empire. Uh, it's blue now instead of uh, green, and we've got Obi Wan's personal starfighter, the Delta Six Aether Sprite, which is this little red starfighter that looks really cool. It's another great ship design from this film. Uh, the battle in the asteroid field is somewhat reminiscent of the battle in Empire, and it looks absolutely excellent. Uh, you know, Django has some really cool uh, weapons on his ship. He's got the seismic charges, and the sound those things make when they go off is really quite good as well. Yeah, that's actually epic fully work, but there is one problem here. Seismic charge. Zero atmosphere. Zero gravitational well. How does this work? Yeah, they, it'd be better if they were just called bombs. I mean, it, it's it's one word. It's like, it's, it creates space sound. Man. It uses THX. THX works in space. But it ain't Dolby Digital Audio. Uh, so, ultimately, we must, of course, cut away from the battle, because as you'd expect, Obi Wan survives. And talk about Anakin and Padme. Do you, do either one of y'all want to cover that? Ah, kind of hoping we could skip it, but really it's exceptionally awkward flirtations. Which eventually lead... I, I don't know how deep you want this rabbit hole to go, but I can speed it up if you want to just skip this and get to the story relevant parts on their side. No, we should talk about it. Since we're here. This is where the infamous line of I hate sand. Spoken as if somebody got some up their ass crack, Annie. It's so like coarse and shit. <laughs> uh, so yeah, Anakin and Padme. So it's spread across two planets of crappiness. 
Now, I will say there were one or two lines that were pretty good oh, no. at the end of the film. So, the first part is they uh, are on this, you know, refugee ship, and there's some really awkward lines uh, where they're first kind of feeling out their relationship. And then they finally make it on Naboo, and that's where the film basically just screeches to a horrible, horrible halt. Because this is one of the problems that Empire had. You know, you've got all the Han and Leia stuff that you want to see, and then it slows down for all of the Luke and Yoda stuff. Well, if you thought the Luke and Yoda stuff was boring, this is worse. Naboo is just them kind of, for want of a better word, frolicking around. And it's real, real cringy. Like, the, the most notable scene from that is like they're having a picnic, which... When I think Star Wars, I think Picnic R. That's what I want to see. You know, that's why Episode 4 was so bad. There was not a space picnic. No, but, that's what you get here. You're in luck. And the picnic. I should probably cut that out because that, that sounds racist. Raycast. But anyway. I think I will cut that out just to be on the safe side. But anyway, the picnic is as boring as you'd expect. But then it's like they're caught in the middle of this stampede of like giant like lizard cows. It's like that that's kind of dangerous there, uh, Padme. Wouldn't wouldn't shouldn't you know that that's there? But yeah, whatever. <sighs> well, at least it's not forty k grocks. <laughs> they wouldn't have survived that. I mean, you never know. We wouldn't. We wouldn't it, the universe is not merciful enough for them to be crushed by those. So then we've got the Tatooine scene. Uh, he goes back to Tatooine, he talks to Watto, like, where is my mother? And I keep thinking to myself, like, wouldn't it have made sense for him to try to find her earlier than this? But, okay. They go try to it find would, his... but he wasn't having nightmares at the time. Uh, and that's another issue. The whole night, he ends up having nightmares about his mother dying. And, of course, he gets there just in time for, you know, her to be dead. He, of course, tracks her down. She's been kidnapped by, you know, sand people and been tortured. And that's one of the things that's kind of interesting, is that, like, in some of the EU works, they try to make the Sand People somewhat uh, sympathetic, even though they they really shouldn't be. Uh, one of the best, like, most impactful scenes of the entire movie. But see, the problem I have with that, though, is it's just too easy. Okay, so his mother dies, and he gets pissed off and kills them all. And he's like, oh, Didn't she get raped, too? It's implied. Well, she was tied up face down, so that might might have been the case. So, the reason I don't particularly like this scene is it's just too easy. It's like, oh, my mother died, and I killed all the sand people, and he killed all the, you know, everybody. He killed, everyone's dead, Dave, essentially. Even okay. the women and children. Exactly. And it's too easy, because it's like, my mother died, now, and I flew into a rage and killed everyone. Okay, that's... What would you wanted? Just face aids? No. From being raped by sand people? No. So. No. What I would have liked was a slower burn fall to the dark side. Where his own... And they kind of do this in episode three. Where his own, you know... Where his own psyche kind of leads him down the dark path. Versus, I can point to one point of trauma in my life. And that is why I am so messed up. That's actually not how it goes. Rules-wise, lore-wise... He actually does earn a lot of dark side points here, but he's not fully gone. He hasn't gone dark side yet. Hmm. I, don't know, I just, in a real world perspective, I think of like that is his obvious excuse that he could give as to why he became Darth Vader, and I just feel like it's just too much of a cop out of the dead parent that you find <laughs> tortured. Somebody's and interviewing out. Vader. So, uh, what made you decide to join the dark side? Well, I lost my mother, and <laughs> here I am after killing tons of younglings. Yeah, and so it's just like it's too much, too fast, you know. Well, it, it can be if you take it at face value. This is actually the story of him taking a hard blow to his psyche. This is you know, the first serious hard knock he's taken. This is the first time he's quote unquote in his own mind failed. Yeah. These failures add up. I can see where you're coming from. I just feel like it would have made... For me, I like the idea of the no easy way to explain why somebody became, you know, evil. 
I guess the, there is that in the expanded, you know, lore. If you're just taking it on face value and looking at one movie at a time, it seems like a total cop out, and I would not blame you. It would be a total cop out. But when you actually look at the psychological profile, the kid suffered from paranoia in his youth, and it just it it was never taken care of. It just grew and grew and grew, and eventually he's killing you know Jedi younglings. Almost like Jake Lloyd. Oh wait, sorry. <laughs> hey, he's not that bad. He's a film editor now, apparently. Uh, what? Um, he uh, got pulled over for speeding with a mental institution because he has schizophrenia. Oh, well. Um, oops. <laughs> you know, See, that's what Jake Lloyd. That's what Lucas will do to you. Ugh. Okay. Hopefully, he's doing better. One would hope. Even he can um, laugh better. and have a sense of humor. <laughs> So, ultimately, what do we got? We got Anakin going nuts a little bit. And right. then... And then... This is... Then, of course, we have the uh, two different plot lines kind of meeting up. At, uh, Obi-Wan ends up finding out where, you know, like the uh, various enemy forces are going to be. And they're going to be on a planet called Geonosis, which is what we're looking at right now. And he goes there by himself. And, of course, he immediately gets captured. Now, he is able to send out a message to Anakin, and, you know, that's where the whole holonet kind of thing... For those who don't know what the holonet is, that's basically the hyperspace communications. And, okay. No hyperpulse generator needed. And, and the only thing is, like, okay, he basically has the equivalent of a space cell phone, and is able to call, you know, like... Maybe not, not millions of light years, but, like, thousands of light years away. So it's like, yeah, You don't have to think... Just, it's one of those things where you don't think about it too hard, and it's okay... Well, in the lore, it actually can be explained. Basically, it's a sublight pulse being sent using the same technology, which basically facilitates warp drives. Yes. Turns out it's a lot easier to transmit information than it is transmit a giant freaking Star Destroyer. Yeah. I suppose. It still just seems a bit silly at times. It can be, yeah. So he gets captured, and then we meet another particularly cool character, Count Dooku. As played by the late Christopher Lee. And there's some callbacks to uh, Empire Strikes Back as well with some of the lines Dooku uses. He's basically trying to get Obi-Wan to join him to destroy the Sith. Yeah, right. Actually, this is partially sincere because he is not actually entirely lying. Yeah, he wants to destroy the Sith so he can rule. And in the EU, we learned that the whole anti-alien thing was already started kind of with him in many instances. Very so, much so. So, the, any, anytime Christopher Lee is on screen, it's great. Just because he is a very charismatic actor, and it's a really cool scene. So, of course, we get Annie and Patty, and they both show up to Geonosis, and we get a particularly cool line about, you know, aggressive negotiations. I quite like that. That was the one moment in the film where it actually felt like they had real chemistry with one another. And so that was particularly good. There's a scene uh, where they're going through a droid foundry. It looks pretty good. The CG there has aged a bit, but not too bad. And this is where we see R2-D2 fly for the first time. And the only yeah, R2-D2 in this movie is kind of a dick. Is that because he kind of this was push C3PO off this ledge to his maybe certain demise, and uh, yeah, let's uh, wait to last second to save Padme from being turned into you know a chunky spot at the bottom of a molten heap of slag. Once again, he's got style. He he wants to be dramatic, you know. You can't save him immediately, otherwise you know it would be peril. Okay, so. As you would expect, Anakin and Patty both get kidnapped. Well, not kidnapped, but captured. Now, this is where we get to the end of the film. And that's one of the big problems with Attack of the Clones. There's a lot of good and there's a lot of bad. And the one thing that, for me at least, kind of pulls it out compared to uh, uh, Phantom Menace is the last 20 minutes. Because the last 20 minutes are great. The last 20 minutes is everything we've been waiting for. Everything we'd slog through with all the crap of the Anakin and Padme scenes, we finally get some wars in our Star Wars. I mean, it's such a unique concept, I know. 
So, as you would expect, they're all sentenced to death in the Geonosian arena. And uh, there's some interesting fights between uh, our three casts, which I guess are supposed to be almost a callback to the original trilogy in some instances. A little bit. We also get to see Kit Fisto being a jolly badass. Yes. Uh, the initial fight is between a bunch of uh, arena monsters but then, a whole army of Jedi show up. This is the first time we've ever seen a whole army of them. Usually we see a grand total of one. You know, we've got, you know, Samuel L. Jackson there. We've got, you know, just everybody's there. We get Anakin just is throwing a lightsaber and he ignites it and just starts cutting people up. It's excellent. It's great. And we get another particularly cool line from Samuel L. Jackson to, saying to Dooku, it's like, this party's over. It's like, why couldn't the whole movie have been like this? Why wait till the last 20 minutes? So, ultimately, the Jedi end up getting kind of overwhelmed. But then, Padme says, Look, the music swells, and we finally have the clone troopers. As a note here, um, now, understand, I saw this right when it came out in theaters, and immediately after, I, for the longest time, was a subscriber of Knights of the Dinner Table. And Spoonie put up his review, and I'm going to rebuke Spoonie right here. I get the negative review for this movie. I understand it. I get the re negative review for the first movie. I understand that. But that being said, Spoonie really, really screwed up in his review here. He called the arrival of Yoda and the clone troopers that we see here as a massive deus ex machina. It's not. In fact, we were explained that they would be sh basically showing up in force three scenes ago to save Obi-Wan. There goes your deus ex machina, Spoonie. Yeah, it's not like they just pulled it out of their ass. Which is quite good. Uh, there's some, some more cool lines. It's like, around the survivors, a perimeter create. It's like, this is Star Wars. Again, finally. The clone troopers look great. The battle sequences with them look amazing. Uh, yeah, the CG is aged because they're all CG. But we finally get wars in our Star Wars. And that's one of the things where this is an example of a film that most of its crap, the last 20 minutes saves it. Because uh, after I saw the film, you know, I wasn't like, I still didn't particularly like it, but I do remember talking in school the next day about. Oh yeah, the clone troopers, they had the spider droids. It's like, oh, it was great, but I would never want to watch it again. So even... Uh, no, go on. The, the problem I see with the movie, for the most part, is the build-up does take a little bit, and the romance between Amidal and... Uh, yeah. Anakin. Yes, Anakin. I'm <laughs> just trying to come up with something cute. Uh, yeah. Other Anakin. than little orphan Annie, but, you know. Those scenes are drug out a little too much, and they are definitely stilted. But understand, the reason why it took so long to get, you know, actual wars in our Star Wars was because you had to set the stage. Action scenes without stage setting are just action scenes which go unnoticed. And unrelated to all of that, what you just said, my god, this level has high bloom! <laughs> uh, that's a hallmark of early to uh, right about mid 2000s gaming. <laughs> Bloom and lens flare. I'm actually going to kill myself so I don't have to deal with this bright desert bloom here. It's right, emo view. <laughs> well, I'd rather feel pain than nothing at all. So the final. Careful, that's not the dark side. So, yeah. Uh, I was my... actually going to sing that song earlier when you were <laughs> talking about how you felt about the film. Well, it is fitting. I like how I've got negative one points. But anyway, where was I? Um, Yeah, so... As good as the clone scenes are, the film does end up having some other problems. Particularly a lot of plot holes that are really dumb. So, ultimately they want to chase down Dooku so we can stop the clone war before it even starts, right? Now... There is one line in the film. Now, the sand line is, of course, one that is constantly reviled. I have a good reason, but the one I think that annoys me the most is, 
Sir, we're out of rockets. Because, of course, they're trying to chase down Dooku and a Republic, a Republic gunship. Dooku is on a space motorcycle. Okay, that's, that's all he's got. And they're out of rockets? You've got, let's see, one, two, I got a poster of this thing. One, two, three, four, five, six different weapons you could use. Six! Shoot him with the fucking front blasters! You know, shoot him with a beam turret! Land on him! Something! He's got a lightsaber. He can deflect, except for the turbo bla blasters, he can deflect most of it. And that he cannot deflect, he can dodge. At least they could have tried. I, I'll admit, and I I get where you're coming from. I have the same problem with, uh, we're just going to let him get away. No, actually, they had no choice. No rockets. They had nothing tr strong enough, nothing dependable enough to take that ship down. Yes, they could have fired with the main blasters. Yes, they could have fired with the turbo blasters. It wouldn't have put a dent in his shields. Uh, it is a bit of a movie cliche. Well, like it the is. First time you've seen a villain just but at least it's a movie cliche with an explanation. Well, and one that would actually hold up with the D20 rules. Uh, blech, that's what I say to that. Alright, so, what do we got afterwards? We've got the final lightsaber duel that is both good and bad. So, the final lightsaber duel it begins with Dooku versus Anakin and Obi-Wan. And Anakin and Obi-Wan get, get, well, get their asses handed to them. And we see the first body part cut off of Anakin. The lightsaber duel isn't bad. I'd say it's actually a little bit better than the uh, Phantom Menace one in that it doesn't go on overly long and it introduces the uh, dual lightsaber duel that would become so popular in literally everything. Because dual sa two lightsabers is better than one. As a note here, this is actually the moment, well, after this is the moment where we see the transition from actual sword fighting techniques, because Dooku's style is actually roughly based on using a rapier. We go from actual sword fighting techniques to raver wars in the next fight. Oh, yes. Which, you know, if you can, if you don't know anything about sword fighting, it's fine. Uh, what we have is uh, Yoda shows up, and this... I love this scene, to be perfectly honest. Yoda shows up to save uh, Anakin and Obi-Wan, and he's just jumping around like a goddamn top. And the, his little battle cry is fucking awesome. It, it just is. And he actually holds his own against Dooku. And the only way Dooku's even able to kind of stop him is by putting Obi-Wan and Anakin into jeopardy. Now, I know that in all reality, Yoda shouldn't be able to do that. You know, I get it. He's way smaller than Dooku. But, I mean, come on. Come on! How... How awesome is it to finally, after all these years, see Yoda kicking ass? And that he does. I mean, even though this is where the realistic sword fighting goes right out the window, imagine hitting something that size with a sword that weighs nothing at the end, and he's moving around like a pinball on me on meth. A pinball on, on meth. So, yeah, Rage, what did you think of it? <laughs> um, yeah, it was a cool scene. It's just like, after all these <laughs> years, Yoda... I mean... So we got Yoda yeah. kicking his ass, but of course, you know, Dooku ends up uh, putting Obi-Wan and Anakin into jeopardy by dropping, him a, dropping a big thing on him, or trying to drop a big thing on him. Now, here's the problem with that. Yoda's able to block it, as you'd expect, but then they just let him go. Like, you know, Anakin and Obi-Wan are safe again, and Yoda just kind of sits there while he slowly gets into his ship. It's like, couldn't you do something, Yoda? You know, like, you know, use the Force to, like, break his fucking cooling line or something. I mean, I get that he has to escape for the rest of the series, but I mean, come on. Well... Uh, the scene actually can be explained away, not in the rule sense, but from a common sense. You got two friends, one who's stabbed in the leg, stabbed in the arm, the other's missing an arm. You're going to want to triage them as quick as possible. As for, you know, using the force to crush a fuel line, something like that, get away, it can be done, but very few people have that fine motor control when it comes to the force. Normally it's, okay, I can move a few small objects, or I can, in the case of Yoda, I can move something which weighs about 
one ton or more. Yoda has some of the most powerful force abilities in the universe, but even he's going to have a hard time worrying about two people that he's taken under his wing on the Jedi Council that he has to know if they're okay and having to take care of that ship that's getting away. Dooku's actually on the ship right as, you know, I mean, he's up the loading ramp right as that giant cooling tower piece, which is about to crush Anakin and Obi-Wan. So he's, he's making good time. That's actually pretty hard to chase. I suppose. So you're being more positive about this film than even I am. Uh, so ultimately the film ends in a suitably... If the writing had been better, it would have ended in a suitably enjoyable fashion. And even I kind of liked it, I, I have to admit. In my, even in, even though I'm kind of curmudgeonly about the film. It basically just ends with Anakin and Padme secretly getting married on Naboo. If the writing had been better, I probably would have liked it more. But, goddamn, that was cringy. Oh, I, I, that's one thing I will not defend. Uh, there are quote-unquote romantic scenes need a lot of work. The rest of the movie, on the other hand, is paced okay. It's It drags really around Padme and little orphan Annie. It's almost like George Lucas maybe is the good at the romantic stuff. Uh, he's horrible at romance. It, well, he... Oh, wait, that was Irvin Christian that's probably good at that, but ultimately... <laughs> what? You know, the guy who did uh, Empire, the stuff between uh, Leia and Han was actually quite good. But, you know... Probably because Harrison Ford's awesome and he probably had broad full. That's true. The, I love you. I know. I know. Well, they kind of had a moment something like that where, you know, right before they're going out to die, you know, Anakin's like, you love me? And Padme's been saying, well, he's, he's going on. He's like, oh, I thought I'd, you know, I'd have to hide this and my life would be ruined by it. It's like, well, our lives are about to be eliminated, so what the hell? Which, you know... I, guess I won't I... go to space jail for this, so yes, I love you. Because, <laughs> <laughs> damn, that's still just weird, though. You know, he was eight when they met. Okay? Like I guess say, Padme's cougar. Oh, God. It's like... Whatever, like Lucas. Rock cradle. Whatever, Obviously. Lucas. It's just, you know, I whatever floats your space boat. Okay, so, final thoughts on Star Wars Episode the Two, The Clone Wars. Uh, could have actually benefited from somebody, you know, helping Lucas out on some of the, the more personal scenes. Though, the choreography is really, really quite good, uh, given what it is and the time frame it was shot. Um, we are introduced to quite a lot of good Jedi. Overall, it... I'm going to rank it as one of, if not the absolute best of the prequel trilogy, not counting the ancillary media. I mean, Clone Wars for life. It's not bad. It's not deserving of any high praise, but I'm going to flat out and say it. Spoonie, you were wrong. Um, he went into it go expecting it to be you know, to ma suddenly make up for everything Episode One did, it's not going to do that. It never could do that. But at least it provides a better movie than Episode One. Rage. Um, it's it's all right. Uh, I think the last half is a little better than the movie, but it's I don't know, it's not the worst film ever. <laughs> Well, if, if you haven't seen it uh, and you want to watch the prequels, go for it. <laughs> as far as I'm concerned, it is an example of when people didn't tell Lucas no yet again, but also it's an example of, you know, it could have been so much more had there been a different director, you know. Had... Or at the very least, a sub-director to say to Lucas, whoa, whoa, this is kind of stupid. Roll this back a little bit. 
it it was so close to being really really good. If and I think there's a reason why episode two just isn't held in nearly as high regard as it possibly could have been. And that's just the Anakin and Padme stuff. That is what really ruins the film. And I think that's what everyone thinks of. It's either that or the Clone Wars stuff. So all the Obi-Wan stuff gets forgotten. It just kind of gets shuffled off in a corner somewhere. Because when you think... When either one of you think Episode 2, what's the first thing that comes to mind? Walk the cradle of love. Oh, wait, no, sorry. (laughs) (laughs) Well, now we've probably corrupted some minds with that. It would seem that way. That is to... a good Billy Isle song, but anyways, rock the cradle of love. Sorry. Oh god! Like I say, there's gonna be an entire generation of people that are now reaching through this that are gonna have mental issues. This is our <laughs> pride and accomplishment right here. This is mm-hmm. our crowning jewel of ruining people's minds. Was totally robbing the cradle. Although I, uh. that makes me think like maybe I should do like a, a YouTube edit where I have like. All the rom- <laughs> romance scenes cut to that song. She was like, ooh, he said I was like an angel. Well, he did say that. <laughs> yeah, and it was cringy as hell when he said it, too. <laughs> All right, so that is Star Wars Episode Two: Attack of the Clones. Wait, wait, wait. Okay, you were asking what the first thing is we think of. Oh, right, right, Episode right. Two. Really, I'd probably say green screen. I mean, you can kind of tell the back. You look a bit artificial. Oh yeah, they did the chroma keying all right, but what they had to work with render wise was a l- it's SGI. It can do a lot, and it did a lot, but there's a limit to render time, and Lucas clearly hit that wall here. Yeah, that is something that I that you notice when you go back to it. You know, I will say that the prequels have aged much more poorly than the original trilogy because. That's CG. Mm -mm. Practical effects versus CG. It's practical effects work because immediately you think about it and you think, okay, a man's hands went into making this. You think CG and it's just, okay, nice computer. Pretty I am kind of curious how the backgrounds would look with that 3D re-release in episode one. I don't know, but I can tell you this. Of all the awards that this was nominated for, the only one I know it won was Best Matte Painting. <laughs> and they weren't that bad. Oh, so one other thing to mention about this is the sheer number of toys that were released. Uh, oh, Lord, the toys. Yeah, the Attack of the Clones, action figures, micro machines. Uh, there were a huge number of games that were released, uh, which one of the, one of the best was, of course, Star Wars: The Clone Wars, which actually takes place shortly after this movie. Uh, in two thousand two, I got me the uh, Slave One. I got Zam's speeder. I got a whole bunch of Django Fets, including one that's rather, um, shall we say, interesting. There is a decapitation Django Fett. It's not I advertised as such, but it exists. Uh, this was the early 2000s. I'm, seriously, what the fuck is wrong with George Lucas? You know, he does Carol robbing stuff, and then he like has like Luke as his sister. And... Hmm. Are we sure he's not Ooh. from, like, Georgia? <laughs> Something foul. Something's rotten in the state of uh, Skywalker Ranch. And it ain't in the library. <laughs> So, yeah, Decapitation Django Fett. Uh, literally, his head is held on with a magnet. Uh, I discovered this one day whilst uh, engaging in imaginary activities with it, and ultimately, head just popped off. I was like, what? It, it, Crippy it, toy? Oh, wait, what? <laughs> why is there a magnet? It's like, they did not advertise that at all. At all! I don't really understand, you know... Why was it? I don't mind that it was made, but it just seems like when you're planning, when you're on the toy planning board at Hasbro, it's like, okay, we've made like eight different Django Fets. What haven't we made? Um, why don't we make one where his head comes off? Sold. Well, they remember, this is the time that uh, they were doing the voice, you know, Voice of the Forest toys where 
Uh, each one of the toys also had a chip in it where, you know, if you had this little black plastic quote unquote communicator device, put the toy there and you'd have various lines. So they were really pushing for everything toy wise. It's like, yeah, what other feature can we put into it? Voice? I don't know how we're going to do it, but we'll do it. Eh, still, though, the toy line was much, much better than anything we'd get today. Well, yeah, uh, that's because they cared back then. Oh, we will definitely talk about the Disney Wars at some point. Ultimately, this is not a great film, not a good film, but you know what? It is a film. And, uh, it's a popcorn movie. In episode two, he's supposed to be 19. He's supposed to be 24. How is he 19? Oh, whatever. I'm not even gonna... He's supposed to be nine, episode one, and she's 14. Oh, okay. That's not as weird as it could be, but still. As stated, she's a cougar. So, yeah, ladies and gentlemen, that is Star Wars episode two. Uh, do y'all recommend watching it or skip it or what? This one I like to recommend watch. Grab you some popcorn, grab some drinks. Put on some Dick. Billy Idol, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. Or <laughs> Netflix and chill. <laughs> like, no, um... And, and just what? enjoy it. It's a popcorn yeah. movie. I recommend it, but I still recommend skipping episode one. You, re- you literally don't need to watch episode one to get this film. You, you don't. It, it's completely unnecessary. Because they end up explaining everything anyway. And this is nowhere near as cringy as episode one is. There's no Jar Jar. He shows up for one scene. And isn't even that bad. In fact, it's kind of pitiful. Uh, so, yeah. Episode two, worth watching. Although, just remember, it's going to drag. All right. Not as so, bad as the first. Which is what few sequels are able to accomplish. And so, wow, we actually recommend episode two. <laughs> I, I didn't expect that myself. Uh, I'm actually going to leave this part in the video, but I'm going to cut the part that I just said out. I did not expect to actually recommend episode two, but the more I thought about it, the more I realized it really is not that bad. So that is the General Lots and Team Seal of Approval. Episode two, not that bad. If you enjoyed this video, please consider subscribing, and if you can, please consider supporting me on Patreon so that I can continue bringing you this awesome content.